namihi nui kia Sasha te kai korero o te rā, tēnā koi. Namihi nui kia koto, kua hui mai nei i tēnei rā, e totoko ana i te ako. I would uh, like to start us with the Treasury Karakia, and others who know it, please do join in. Ko te tai whakarunga, ko te tai whakararo, ko te tai tokaro, ko te tai tonga, ko te tai hoa uru, ko te tai rāwhiti. Tene, ko te tai ohanga, hui e, tai ki e. So once again, no my harimai and welcome to everyone. It's great to see those online. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation, which is a part of the Treasury's Wellbeing Seminar Series. Um, back in April, I was pleased to launch the first in this series of seminars, uh, outlining a work program that is going to culminate in the Wellbeing Report or Te Tai Waiora at, uh, that, that the Treasury will release at the end of this year. Um, Te Tai Waiora is going to be a report on the state of wellbeing in Aotearoa, New Zealand, how that has changed, um, how wellbeing is distributed across our society, and also on the sustainability of wellbeing. And in my presentation back in April, I highlighted that uh, Te Tai Waiora will be underpinned by two wellbeing frameworks, the Living Standards Framework and also He Ara Waiora which is a framework that helps the Treasury to understand why order, um, often translated as a Māori perspective on, uh, on wellbeing. And developing and applying these frameworks is a strategic priority for the Treasury. We aim to increasingly apply He Ara Wai Ora alongside the Living Standards Framework as we, uh, as we gain insights from uh, exploring wellbeing from different cultural perspectives and different knowledge systems. Um, so given that priority, we are really privileged today to have Sasha McMeeking talk to us about He Ara Wai Ora, um, to support a wider understanding of the framework and, and also to support our learning in how to uh, apply He Ara Wai Ora in a really meaningful and in an authentic way. So uh, Sasha, again, welcome. Um, also welcome to your little one, your um, Pepe. It's wonderful to have that intergenerational um, view in our in our conversation today about wellbeing from a uh, from a Te Ao Māori perspective. Um, Sasha has played a really key role in the development of He Ara Wai Ora right from the start of the process, working with a group of uh, rangatira um, initially through the tax working group uh, process back in back in 2017. And Sasha is now a member of that uh, rangatira group called Na Pukinga. And uh, the Treasury walks alongside um, Na Pukinga. They, they walk alongside us to develop and uh, to apply He Ara Wai Ora. Um, so the, the Treasury as a whole are, and, and I personally am, I'm incredibly grateful to Sasha for her leadership in this mahi and um, in the important role that she's played in the development of He Ara Wai Ora. It is, it's making a real difference in the Treasury's ability to better weave to our Māori perspectives into our policy work, into our, um, into our advice. I would say that we are still at the early stages in our application of He Ara Wai Ora, but we're investing in our understanding of, of how to do so. Uh, and we're really thankful for the wisdom, the guidance of Sasha and uh, of other Ngāpukinga members in this, in this work. Um, so I was really keen to open this event today so that I could acknowledge and thank um, Sasha for this quarter all. Um, unfortunately, I, I do need to leave just before the end of um, Sasha's presentation and uh, can't stay for what I know is going to be a really stimulating and challenging discussion um, with you all. Um, so I'm going to hand the floor over to Phil Evans. Uh, and Phil is one of our real leaders in Te Tai Ohanga on He Ara Wai Ora. Phil's going to chair the rest of the session and facilitate um, the discussion. So, nā reira, tēnā kōta katoa, e noho rā, pikitikaha. Phil, over to you. Oh, tēnā koe, e te kaihautu a Cara Lee. Uh, nau te takapau i hora mō tāta nei kōrero i tēnei wā. O tira, koutou rā, ko hoi hoi mai nei i te karanga o tō tāta nei kaupapa rangatira, o tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Uh, ko Phil Evans toko ingoa. Huri tēnei no Taranaki Maunga ko Ngāti Mutunga te iwi, uh, ki a huri whakate tonga uh, ko, uh, ko oraka te, te moana, ko aparima te awa, ko kaitahu te iwi, nā reira tēnā koutou. 
Um, I'd like to welcome everyone um, today to the seminar, which as Carolee has mentioned, is part of a, a broader wellbeing program that we've got going in a, a seminar series. Um, and our aim here is to bring in um, external ideas as a source of challenge and intellectual stimulation as we work on these important kaupapa. So it's part of an opportunity to learn with interested people across Aotearoa and to broaden the discussion. Um, we've got a range of seminars going, uh, the rest of 2022 and early 23, um, with the participation of uh, international and experts from Aotearoa New Zealand. So I'd like to tautoko uh, ngā mihi kua mihi a e karali uh, ki tō tātou nei uh, kai kōrero, kai kōrero i tēnei wā ki a Sasha, uh, tēnā koe te rangatira, uh, no mai, no mai haramai a ipurangi ki roto i tahau maru o tō tātou nei whare kōrero ko ngā mokopuna a tāne. Um, this baby has been a part of uh, a lot of our discussions with Sasha and um, has always had a very vocal contribution to make. Um, so, so Sasha is an associate professor at the University of Canterbury and as Carolee has mentioned, um, a real intellectual leader and instrumental in synthesising some of the corridor that's been gathered um, from um, thought leaders in Te Māori about the Hiara Waiora framework. Um, so she's explored Mātauranga sourced approaches to articulating and measuring what matters um, since a 2010 Fulbright Harkness Fellowship, which produced a toolkit for Māori organisations to embed tradition based values into commercial and iwi decision making. And this body of works continued to evolve, um, exploring the conceptualisation of wellbeing. Uh, mechanisms of social change to achieve better well-being and measurement systems. So Sasha has really traversed um, academic and practitioner roles at a senior leadership level. Um, she has an MPhil from Cambridge University's Judge Business School and an LLM ONS from the University of Canterbury. So today Sasha is going to talk about the application of Hiara Waiora within a broader contextualisation of its place in global well-being approaches and specifically in relation to um, the Living Standards Framework. Uh, her presentation recognises that applying the framework deeply will be challenging for government and other sectors as it inverts many of the kind of Western assumptions that implicitly shape um, our understanding of what wellbeing is, whether we're aware of those or not. Um, and so this is very relevant to my work um, as a principal policy advisor in the Treasury and the Te Ao Māori Policy and Strategy Team. Um, and as Carolee mentioned, a big part of that is the application of Hiara Waiora. So I'm very excited for today's presentation and I hope you all are too. Um, I'm going to hand to Sasha shortly uh, to talk for about 45 minutes and then the remainder will have time for Q&A. Um, I suggest this will work best if you pop your questions in the chat. Um, if there's a particular question that appeals to you that you'd like me to put to Sasha on behalf, I suggest you you might want to upvote that with a thumbs up and I'll, I'll try and um, go to the, the most upvoted, upvoted ones first. So um, yeah, let's go that way. And for the moment, I'll hand over to Sasha to um, give her corridor. So nā reira e no mai te rangatira, hei a koe te rākau corridor. I nga mai ngā whakahi ko aro mai nei e pāna te kaupapa whakahirihira ki a mai tātou e rere ana nga mihi mai te kūtou ki o kūtou ki o kūtou i mai nga ki o kūtou whenua ki o kūtou tūpuna nga mihi ki nga kaiwhakaritzi me nga kaiwhakahairi o te kōrero nga kaniti mihi anō ko waiau i uri o tahi pōtuke ko kāti whairapa me kāti hā tea tea ka hapū uh, ko Sasha McMillan to go now. Ko Matangi Leia Tinai. Um, it's a real pleasure um, and an honour to be able to contribute to the seminar series. The work that the Treasury is doing in the area of wellbeing, I think, is globally leading and inspiring. And um, I've been deeply honoured to have the roles that I have had during it, um, which. Um, at this time of Matariki, when it's an opportunity to acknowledge those who have passed, as well as look forward into the future, 
want to particularly pay tribute to Matua Manuka Henare and Matua Puri Shasha, um, who were instrumental in the formulation of Kaoru Bayora, um, whom we lost since its inception, um, as well as to acknowledge all of the other Pukinga uh, or Namutu who were the ones who generated all of the content. My role was to translate and synthesize um, in um, all, all credit to the brilliance, um, to those Pukinga, um, Whaya Neida, Matua Rikirangi Gage, um, Timura Hall um, and many others that if Matangi Leia wasn't being quite so energetic with my notes, I might have a better chance of um, recollecting the full names. Um, so I think um, the opportunity to talk to Hiara Waiora at this time is powerful as we come into a week where we're going to mark for the first time um, a public holiday that embodies Matauranga Māori. And I think Haro Waiora has a spirit that is very much aligned to marking Matariki as a nation, which is that Haro Waiora um, has national and global resonance of reframing those things that we value. And in this presentation, would like to be able to talk to the relationship between Haro Waiora and the Living Standards Framework with a real focus on being able to understand the points of alignment and um, difference between the two approaches. Because Hiaro Waiora is young. It embodies ancient knowledge, but it's young. So we were all learning how to apply it and how it can realize the aspirations we all have for it. And so this is an opportunity for us to learn together as much as um, I hope I've got some contributions to make. These thoughts are very much emergent as I think we make new ways of being able to articulate and simply those things that matter most. Um, oh, um, and <clears throat> apologies for the at times not melodious contributions of Matangi. So, um, so what I wanted to do with this presentation um, is moved through three parts to each of the living standards and how to why order. Um, first to locate each of them in their respective whakapapa. Uh, the second is to unpack some of the assumptions and understandings that tacitly um, underpin their foundations. And then the third to look at um, some of their application with the application in the context of how to why order being something that is evolving and that luckily we all get to contribute to. So <clears throat> starting with the living standards framework, I think what the living standards framework endeavours to do as a purpose in life is to answer how does the state measure and through the power of measurement advance what matters. And I think that starting point is really important when we contrast it against um, what how to why order seeks to do in the world. And um, so for the living standards framework, I think there's a really important whakapapa that connects the living standards framework back into our human rights movement um, globally. When we look at what the living standards framework does, um, it's trying to articulate the conditions in which human dignity can flourish. So the living standards framework, with its articulation of the dimensions of well-being, is I, I think really describing the conditions in which human dignity flourishes. And the, the origin of that idea, um, we can trace it back through our various human rights instruments. If we go to the the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, it was the first attempt to affirm that human dignity um, had multiple dimensions to it that needed to be safeguarded. That as we um, move through time, got further specified and codified with um, the human rights conventions, civil and political rights, social, economic and cultural rights, um, and so forth. 
And then from there, I think we had a period where it took us time to appreciate that merely affirming and codifying the conditions for human dignity to flourish was not enough to ensure their realisation. Um, because then we can jump forward to various um, <clears throat> new approaches to supporting the conditions for human dignity to flourish. Things like the Sustainable Development Goals or their predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals, which in my mind um, aim to interpret those human rights standards and create a focal point for states and other entities, whether it's business or NGOs or the like, to converge on various implementation efforts that will enable um, those human rights standards to be realised in practice. And at about a parallel um, point in time, there was a greater focus on measurement frameworks. So um, using the power of measurement to accelerate and amplify the focus on the things that really matter as well. And so we can look to the OECD's Better Living um, approach, which very much informed our living standards framework. And between those two things, um, I think the, the whakapapa of the living standards framework shows that the, the emphasis has been on finding ways to create the conditions in which human dignity can flourish. And um, that point about the conditions is really important that I'll, I'll come back to and underscore a few more times. Um, because while the focus has been on conditions, there have also been through that various different formulations about how we can categorise name and describe the different dimensions of well-being, whether that's <clears throat> uh, looking at the, the four capitals or now five if you support um, cultural capital being included in that, um, and the, the other dimensions which in these frameworks typically relate to facets that are observable. So dimensions of well-being like health or physical safety or the like. And um, we'll also come back to that issue of dimensions because I think in the global tradition, there's been lots of different taxonomies for how we could describe those dimensions. But there hasn't been a clear favourite chosen for how we could or should describe them, um, which becomes important for Hiara Wai Order. Um, and sitting underneath that whakapapa um, is, I think, a range of tacit assumptions that inform the nature, operation, purpose of these types of frameworks. And um, we can we could go in lots of different directions for um, tracing those tested assumptions. But one that I think is important and potentially under-recognised um, is the role of Maslow's hierarchy. So this screen um, shows a reinterpretation um, visually of Maslow's hierarchy while keeping the same content about, um, and for some of you, it'll been a while since you've thought about Maslow. So I'll just bring him back to front of mind, where Maslow had that pyramid shape where you started with physical security and then you moved through safety, which was a gateway into love and belonging and esteem and self-actualization. What he's framing in that way is the, um, the gateways of well-being. First, you look after physical security then the next space is gaining safety. And then next space is the opportunity to gain well-being through love and belonging um, through up into self-actualization. And I think that way of understanding movement towards well-being, I think is highly influential um, as an underpinning for um, the way in which living standards framework and its various cousins around the world have been framed. 
and um, <clears throat> particularly in the way it's got a sequential move from protecting their conditions to um, supporting um, relationality between humans, then feelings, and then purpose. And more specifically, I think if we look at our living standards framework, primarily um, the, the measures and the indicators in that framework, like its global cousins, are focused on articulating those first two layers in Maslow's hierarchy with a little bit of reach into love and belonging, um, which mirrors our human rights standards largely. And um, so we've got these approaches to well-being and human dignity that focus on creating an enabling context by looking after the conditions in which an individual might be able to um, realise feelings and purpose in life. And I think um, that broad approach um, we, we treat it as um, almost inviolate, I think, because it accords with lots of the implicit principles about our constitutional order, about um, the, the line at which the state cannot or should not interfere in the private lives of citizens. And I, I think that's also important um, because when it comes to the way in which how to way order approaches well-being, that line between where the state can or cannot or should or should not go um, is potentially different, which is where I want to go to now. So with um, Hiaro Waiora, I, I think the, the key question that drove the discussions and the development of Hiaro Waiora was the question of how do we conceptualise wellbeing? And on the basis of that conceptualisation, how might we encourage the state to do things differently to realise those notions, that, that different notion of well-being? And I, I think that's a really important distinction from the Living Standards Framework. So the Living Standards Framework borrowed from um, various global approaches to describing the dimensions of well-being, but it it didn't um, it didn't have the purpose of trying to create a coherent, fulsome conceptualization of well-being and what it um, could or should mean in our national context. And <clears throat> that's important for Hiaro Wai Order because Hiaro Wai Order comes into approaching that question within its own whakapapa. So the um, Hiaro Wai Order is a kaupapa Māori model for well-being steps into um, a journey in the development of kaupapa Māori models. The, um, the most famous um, kaupapa Māori model, which many of you will be familiar with, is um, Whare Tapa Whā from Ta Mason Jury, which I think um, is the leading light in a range of metaphorical models. So um, where metaphor was used to convey a Māori worldview, to help people understand um, Māori ways of conceiving of a particular thing, in that case, health. And then following on from the metaphorical models, um, we had a range of practice guides developed, and that image is one from Te Whāriki in the education sector, where um, there was an attempt to translate in really practical how-to terms, how people who wanted to could implement kaupapa Māori um, principles and practices in their day job. And then the third type of kaupapa Māori model that we see are ones like the Māori model depicted on the screen, which attempt to use measurement um, so that we use kaupapa Māori standards um, to measure whether something is good or bad or which direction it happens to be travelling. 
And Hyaro Waiora has the benefit of learning from all of those and approaching the question of how do we conceptualise wellbeing while trying to embody all of those dimensions. Can we use the power of metaphor, practice guidance for how to, and ultimately measurement um, to track progress as well as um, incentivize it being prioritized. It learns from all of those um, and is arguably um, one of the, the first of its time in trying to be all of those things at once. And it definitely won't be the last and it will continue to evolve. And the way that it um, endeavours to, to step into that whakapapa of kaupapa Māori models um, is <clears throat> it brings this image, which has a lot baked into it. And I, I don't have time today to talk to all of the dimensions of Hara Waiora, but I do want to talk to how it fits together and then focus on one particular dimension of it. So that um, what that graphic is trying to convey um, is first that it's based on a takarangi pattern. So the, um, the takarangi pattern where there's um, kuru feeding into each other um, is trying to communicate that all of the dimensions of well-being contained in the Hara Waiora um, are interrelated. They, they feed each other and they are necessary as cumulative parts to achieve well-being. And then the, <coughs> excuse me, the different coloured circles um, are about communicating different dimensions of well-being. So at the centre is wairua, about um, in order for there to be well-being, there has to be a connection back to source in wairua tanga. The second circle is the tile. Um, and what that is endeavouring to communicate is that when we approach well-being, it shouldn't be human-centric. We should be able to recognise that um, the well-being of the tile is a precursor to human well-being and independent to some extent of human well-being. And then the maroon circle is the iratangata dimension. So the human dimension of well-being that has four distinct um, components to it, each of which is infused with he tangata he kāinga, meaning that there is a relationship between individual and collective embedded with all of those spheres of human well-being. And from the discussions um, amongst Ngā Pukinga, there were four spheres of human well-being identified, mana tukuihu, um, or identity, um, mana āhinga, um, about aspiration and capability, mana whanake about prosperity and resources, and mana tautotu about um, belonging and responsibility within communities. And so those three dimensions, wairua, taiao and era tangata, are within Hiara Waiora the ends. So they are the substantive manifestations of well-being. Um, when there is connection to wairua, when there is um, well-being within the tile, within the human dimension, when there is a strong, cohesive identity, plus when there is um, aspiration and capability to realise um, those things that are valued by individuals and communities, when there is prosperity, and when there is um, a strong sense of belonging between humans, that's when well-being exists. So that's the um, substantive conceptualization of well-being, which is then surrounded in the blue circle um, with a range of means values. So <clears throat> um, these are the process elements. And in this part, the, um, this really important to emphasise that Hiara Waiora was made to guide the crown. So there's a strong emphasis on how the crown can conduct itself to contribute to well-being. And those are the um, principles of kotahitanga, tikanga, whanaingatanga, tiakitanga and manakitanga. That in order for well-being to exist, um, <coughs> the crown um, 
embodying those principles is important and necessary. And the final outer circle, Y order, um, is there to reflect that um, it takes ends plus means to achieve well-being. So those substantive elements um, plus those instrumental or means values to achieve well-being. And um, I am going to talk more to each of those dimensions with a couple of different visuals. Um, so this one, I just want to um, communicate the cumulative nature of um, well-being as conceptualised within the Harawai order, and that it's and all of the dimensions, which I think is a really important distinction to the living standards framework, because in the living standards framework, um, it's expected that there will be um, independence between the various dimensions of well-being um, and the interrelationship between them is not interrogated um, with, I think, the same level of depth that Hara Wai Order does. Um, um, conscious of time, I will move to the, the next conceptualisation, which is this one, that um, if we just look at ira, the ira tangata dimension for interest of time, and really because talking to wairua tanga and te taiao, um, is probably above my pay grade. Uh, when I talk to just the ira tangata dimension to try and provide um, greater depth in terms of how the bits fit together, as well as be able to talk in more practical terms to how it might be applied. So this is, I think, if we were going to take that same picture that I used to um, present Maslow's hierarchy, this is how that same kind of picture would be reframed with the dimensions um, or spheres of well-being within Ira Tangata and Hiarawai Ura, um, with the important point that because these are cumulative, um, it assumes that they they all subsist simultaneously, whereas in um, Maslow's hierarchy or in the various frameworks that follow on from that, um, it's like a gateway from the physical and the practical into elements of meaning and purpose. Within Hara Wai Ora, as I understood the dialogue between Nga Pukinga, um, it was about all of the dimensions being present together. And importantly, they typically um, invert the hierarchy that Maslow has. So um, mana tōtō tu about being known and being responsible within communities um, is a sense of belonging, is being necessary to well-being. That is centred in a way that it's not um, within other frameworks. No? Um, <clears throat> mana tuku yuhu about um, that being centred with the importance of um, having that coherent identity, um, capabilities and aspirations, I, I think, um, and the way the discussions happened, they were very similar to the nature of capabilities that Sen advocates for with a real focus on um, the capabilities that are valued um, by the particular um, communities or individuals and prosperity and resources being there um, in that um, <clears throat> they almost have an instrumental relationship with the other spheres of well-being. And across all of those discussions about the dimensions of well-being within how to why order i think there were um I, I think all of those dimensions in the discussion there was a consistent emphasis about the importance of matching choice and ability so the ability um to choose identity as well as having the real world opportunity um to experience that identity um, or capability 
um, or the other spheres of well-being. And in and, and this sense, um, th this also has alignment with Sen's work about the concept of a substantive freedom. Um, so it has alignment, but it also has points of distinction, because I think um, while he a way order is not intended to be solely applied to things Māori, um, it's intended to be a mātauranga Māori framework that can be applied um, to consider the well-being of any community to the extent that it's relevant and resonant. Um, there are particular dynamics that we have to engage with um, in New Zealand about <clears throat> There are many things that that colonisation does, um, and one of them is that it constrains the limitlessness um, of aspirations with those who were um, affected by colonisation. So when we talk in this context about having um, the ability to choose to craft an identity in a particular way, or choose to value and therefore or pursue particular capabilities, um, we can't presume that um, the aspiration is as bold or as limitless as it could be because of the context that we um, inherit as part of our historical legacy. Um, and the other dimension is about opportunity, the, the real world context in which these choices um, are being made, which takes into account both the structural influences on freedom of choice, um, as well as um, the very practical aspects of opportunity. Um, if I want to choose, although I, I don't actually have the capability to do it, but if I wanted to choose to live a life um, solely using te reo Māori, the real world context for me to be able to go and buy a pair of shoes in te reo Māori is constrained even if the, um, the structural the restrictions on that are removed in practice, um, the, the context doesn't enable all of that choice. So I think as we look at all of these dimensions of, um, of well-being, oh honey, did that bunny bite you? Um, of identity and belonging and capabilities and prosperity, um, it's about asking questions about how free and actual is that choice um, it, within the human structural and practical context. Um, and then the second part are those means values. Um, kotahitanga, tsukanga, fananga tanga, tiakitanga, and manakitanga. And that um, it's important to also understand the. Um, I might just, in the interest of time, um, slip to here. So um, when we're thinking about well-being, what these dimensions of Hiaro Waiwara ask us to do, I think, is to think about um, the scope of policy, the role of power and process and purpose and how we're shaping policy. Um, and that's because kotahitanga and the way that it was framed by the participants was about alignment and unity within the Crown. So. Um, in creating policy or approaches to enhance well-being, there needed to be um, unity across government. If there's going to be unity across government, then it's quite possible that the scope of policy um, might need to change. Tukanga was framed as being about the right decision maker and the right process. So fundamentally, that's about um, the location and form and structures around power and policy. Um, whanaingatanga um, was discussed by participants in the sense of being able to foster layered relationships between um, Crown and communities. So that kind of, it, it moves us away from thinking about that consultation to engagement spectrum and more into thinking about 
nurturing ongoing relationships and the layering of them in the development of um, sound and desirable solutions. Um, te akitanga about taking um, time horizons, longer term time horizons than we're used to. And manakitanga was talked about um, in a way that is deeper than how we'd commonly refer to it um, or translate it as hospitality. So um, manakitanga, if you break it down another way, um, can mean to fill with mana. Um, so that the purpose of policy um, arguably should be to to fill people with money, um, but to do so requires a really deep knowledge of the circumstances of those um, communities that are sought to be served. Um, and, um, and that the, the mechanisms or the delivery for um, that policy also matters. Um, to, Demonstrator's point, uh, Rikirangi, when he was talking about manakitanga, gave the example of um, if you want a pen and I throw a pen across the room to you, it's not manakitanga. So you might have got the outcome, you got the pen, um, but I threw it at you, so it's not manakitanga. So that um, the mechanisms for delivery also matter. So, <clears throat> so what does that mean if um, we're trying to apply how to wild in? Well, I, I think it means um, that we're, we're looking beyond concepts of just measurement and trying to broaden our lens away from GDP. I, I think what how to wild order is asking us to do um, is to think more broadly about how we achieve um, or how we foster or encourage well-being. And this is a generic picture of an intervention logic which I think um, is just to try and make it clear that if we're looking at the living standards framework, it would um, its primary point of influence is down the end on the right, about helping us be able to see the outcomes. Um, and seeing those outcomes does genuinely broaden our view. And um, just for clarity, I think the living standards framework is a really valuable contribution to our national landscape. And I'm very grateful that it's there and for all of the work that's gone into it. So this isn't a criticism, this is trying to um, show the points of distinction. Because I think how to why order, um, if we're to apply it deeply, um, aims to influence the way that we think about um, what we do in a policy sense at more points than the living standards framework. Um, and so that the, the first point where those conceptual dimensions of well-being um, really encourage us to, to think deeply is in terms of the activities, what it is that we choose to do, um, as well as the next one about who we choose to engage and then how we think about what success looks like in terms of those results. And for that first one about what are the activities that we might choose to do, um, I think how do I order um, invites us to ask ourselves a series of questions um, when we're thinking about what we could, should do in a particular context. Um, and it asks us to ask questions about both choice and ability, um, about the level of aspiration to inform the freedom of choice, as well as the landscape of structural and practical opportunity. So for, um, for identity, how are people enabled um, to choose or craft their identity? How are people enabled to uh, determine what it is that they value in terms of capabilities and therefore how they're pursued, um, how people are enabled to create prosperity um, and to create bo bonds of belonging and reciprocity. In, um, and then their counterparts in the sphere of opportunity. And I think <clears throat> these types of questions are ones that um, come out of a mātauranga Māori approach to articulating well-being 
But in doing so, um, I think they've also got connections to broader global movements. Mariano, um, oh my gosh, I've forgotten your name. Um, Mazzucato's work on green challenges, for example. So I think this type of conceptualization of well-being um, sits alongside those global movements, which are asking for broader ways of unifying action to create um, different types of solutions. And that's really the power of Hauru Wai Order, in my opinion, is that it asks us to um, question the assumptions that have kept us into um, reasonably bounded solution making and to explore um, broader ways of contributing to if their dimensions of well-being, then their um, normative or inherent goods. So uh, a couple of examples, I think. Um, so the, this morning was in a conversation about Māori economic development. So how could Māori economic development, for example, use how to why order to guide what could or should be done? And um, at first blush, it's like, well, no, it just this surely how to why order must be too broad to be useful in that way. But I don't think it is. I, I just think it reorients how we might approach the puzzle. Um, so, for example, what's the role of um, economic development uh, in creating choices and opportunities for people to craft their identities um, in a way that they might value? And so that that example of can I buy shoes using te reo rangatira, well, potentially economic development um, is the way to enable that. Um, or equally, if we're to, to take that, um, that approach and to think of how to why order is um, convening and aligning efforts on um, paramount dimensions of well-being, it means that things like the transport sector can ask the question about what's the transport sector's contribution or potential contribution to healthcare. Um, and and that could be really significant if the um, if the frame of mind is, is different from a more typical singular dimension approach to well-being, because the transport system could solve lots of our rural access to healthcare challenges um, if it was so oriented. And I think that's the invitation that Hauru Wai Order makes for all of us. Um, to approach things with a broader view about um, the interrelationship between ends and means um, and possibly to take um, a more philosophical approach to the way we think about well-being rather than the, um, the measurement focused and therefore quite um, mechanical approach to well-being um, that's being driven through alternative frameworks. And again, um, I, don't, I don't want um, any misinterpretation that um, mechanical is bad. I think mechanical is really important um, to, to get us to a place where we can also have conversations about the conceptualization of those things that that matter most or that we value most in understanding um, understanding well-being. And um, in concluding points, so that there is some time for um, discussion. I think that um, oh, honey, um, inviting us to take that conceptual approach to how we understand well-being um, is where I think it's really important to emphasise that Haro Wai Ora is not just meant to be about things Māori. Um, that if we are, if we can open up the the conversation about how we conceptualise well-being, the assumptions that we bring to it, and um, the scope of thinking whether it's just measuring or whether it's framing our approach to solution building, 
Um, I think it has got national relevance and a national contribution that connects us with a uniquely Indigenous approach um, to that thinking about convening to solve the grandest challenges of our time. And um, we'll finish with um, the quote from Einstein that furiously gets misappropriated about we can't hope to solve um, a problem in the same consciousness that created it. And I think um, that's the potential gift of Hyara Wai Order, of it brings um, an additional worldview and an additional consciousness that can help us approach the complex challenges of our time um, in a different way. And at that point, my wife, the Tautoko, is about to contribute. Um, so I thank you again for sticking through. I thank you again for being patient while um, Matangi had a meltdown and look forward to uh, any conversation that we're able to have. Kia ora, Sasha. Um, I, I found that really um, interesting and obviously highly relevant to my own work, but um, the chat's full of um, some great comments as well. There's a lot of mihi to you and to baby. Um, there's also some um, really interesting questions, and I think the top upvoted one is from Betsan. Betsan me to Partai who's asking about the place of te tiriti in, um, in these frameworks. Um, so you, you might be able to answer that from a Hara Waiora perspective. Well, I think that's um, a, a really important question. And um, I think there's a, a distinction between um, the treaty as um, a mechanism to create change um, as opposed to the substance of the treaty. And um, so to me, Hara Wai Ora is, um, gives effect to some of the spirit of the treaty in a really meaningful way. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't use the treaty to argue for the legitimacy of its existence. Um, so we're, we're really used to hearing that um, you must abide by the principles of the treaty in whatever language. Um, how do I order leapfrogs that stage to say if the Crown was able to meaningfully adopt how do I order, then it would make a meaningful step towards genuinely being able to implement the treaty, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I think potentially in our national journey, um, that's increasingly where I think there's value in focusing. Um, the, the treaty will always be relevant. It is the founding document of our nation and it will always be speaking. And increasingly what I think the job of our generation is, is to develop tools that can enable it to be substantively implemented. Didn't like the mouse. Um, and that's what I think Hyara Wai Order is. It's um, one tool to help with the substantive implementation of the treaty. Hmm. Um There's a question here from Paula, uh, Tenakwe Paula. She's directed at me asking what the interest in the, this approach is from other countries with indigenous populations. Well, I, I could talk f between governments, but perhaps Sasha, you might be able to comment on um, what corridor interaction there might have been with other indigenous peoples around the world. Um, not, not directly at this time, but I think um, that's partially because Hyara Wild has only become more visible um, quite recently. But I think in lots of the predecessor frameworks, there's been a high degree of um, kind of cross fertilization. And I think um, that will continue. But um, Phil will have, I think, more helpful things to say. Yeah, uh, I can say that we've um, had cordial with. Uh, other governments, including Australia and Canada, who, um, who are very interested um, in this approach, and um, also um, the Scandinavian treasuries, um, who are all kind of trying to apply a wellbeing approach, 
um, were, were quite taken with Hiara Waiora. Um, so Preston has asked a great question here, Tanakwe Preston. He's um, asking one which often comes up for me, which is, and so I'd be really interested in your perspective, Sasha. What role of any do trade-offs play in Hiara Waiora? He says, inverting dimensions makes any trade-offs just as important, it seems to me, very relevant in resource-restricted environment. Yeah, and I um, I think that's going to be a fascinating thing that we work through as we apply it more fulsomely. Um, and potentially I'm too optimistic, but I think that um, if we're... Um, if we're starting from a point where the, the parameters are about um, interrelationships rather than um, about independent spheres, I think that means we come up with different types of solutions and um, those different types of solutions have um, less hard butting up points for trade-offs um but we're in that that's my optimistic um attempt at a crystal ball which might prove to be wrong and the, the only honest answer is we don't know yet how trade-offs will work um now, to all of those of you who are asking who's the treasury point of contact and where to find more um, resources, um, I'll probably fess up and say it's me. And bef um, as we conclude, I'll, I'll drop a, a link to our website in here so you can see um, what resources we already have available. Um, Sasha, there's, there's a few questions I could group up here about um, what, what are the next steps? I mean, that's partly... Uh, question for us and Ngāpūkinga, but what, what are your views? How would you like to see um, how to wild or develop from here? Um, I think that's a great question, and there are a number of threads to, um, to the work programme in terms of, I think there's, there's elements of um, deeper deeper articulation of the dimensions of well-being because um, it is, I think you all, all have noted, there's not enough written down, there's not enough that provides really clear scaffolding for each of the conceptual elements. So I think there's um, there's a need to, to have more written resources out there on the conceptual elements. Um, I think there's a need to work through really practical how-tos and um, there's a need to develop and it's already and train really clear outcome metrics for each of the dimensions and when I'm saying that that just goes back to the whakapapa of kaupapa Māori frameworks that we've seen so having deeper conceptual work that explains the dimensions of well-being um, is akin to what the metaphorical models did, having um, clearer guidance, what are the questions that go into the policy development process and how might you turn those questions into um, an upgraded um, regulatory impact statement, for example. Um, that's, the, that's building out the practice guidance elements of Karawai order. And then the outcome metrics part, um, means that it is a clearer partner to the living standards framework um, because those indicators will ideally um, capture the essence of um, those dimensions of well-being which will contrast with the, um, the indicators in the living standards framework that are very much based on observable um, objective indicators, which are important, and I know the statisticians hate all things subjective um, in their data collection processes, and that's fair, it's hard and it's laborious, um, and th there's lots of challenges with subjective elements, but I think um, potentially how to way order will lead us into nationally how we might do more 
um, subjective experiences of well-being to complement um, more of the observable elements of the, the conditions in which we all exist. And um, in those three parts of work, we'll hopefully, and um, to some extent this is reliant on Treasury's generosity, um, happen at rapid speed to make it clearer for all of us. Kia ora. Sasha, um, are there any more burning questions? I think a lot of these are probably for the Treasury to pick up and um, kind of provide advice around where to find resources or um, how to do certain things within government. Um, if there's any burning last ones, pop them in the chat now. Otherwise, we'll let Sasha um, go back and um, do some tiakitanga uh, with respect to um, Matangi, Matangi Lea. Carl. Um, all right. Well, I think we might we might actually bring it to a close then. Um, so I, I really want to thank you um, for your for your time, Sasha, um, and uh, um, for the amazing job you always do in um, jug, juggling roles of fire with, uh, with with that of imparting your your wisdom, um, which we at the Treasury have been. Um, beneficiary of and um, obviously intend to, to keep this um, relationship going. I'm reminded of the uh, the Whakatauki Tate Tamariki Tana Mahi Wawahi Taha. You know, it's the job of children to, to kind of smash things up and challenge us and, um, you know, keep us on our toes. Um, so, yeah, huge mihi to you and um, to everyone who's, who's joined us here as well. I hope you found that really useful and, and maybe made um, a bit of a connection to this mahi. Um, so, yep, in answer to the questions, um, I'm your sort of um, contact point for Hiara Wairo within the Treasury, and um, maybe look forward to talking to many of you again soon. Um, but please look out for the other upcoming events we have in, in the Wellbeing Seminar Series. I think Diana mentioned we have um, Romley from, to give, from Australia to give an Indigenous perspective coming up at some point in the future. Um, we also have Nancy Hay from the What Works for Wellbeing Centre in the UK and Ilan Noy from Victoria University on understanding and managing New, New Zealand's risk profile. But again, huge mihi to you, ite tuahine, raua ko tō pēpi, inei rā ngā mihi, uh, and to everyone, kia koutou rā, um, ngā mihi uh, mō tō tai mai nei, um, me whakakapi o tātou, Mahi o tēnei wā ki te karakia, nā reira piki te kaha, piki te ora, piki te wairua, mauri ora e. Mā te wā, whānau, thank you for your participation. <laughs>